our journey began in the harsh desert of Egypt. After we witnessed the emergence of math in early civilization, we saw it instilled with a new spirit in Greece, where it was harnessed with logic and organized arguments. After that, math evolved further in the East. The number zero was created by a people who loved their gods and believed in eternity. And the innovation of zero helped them change the human spirit. Now, we head to Europe, where math was reborn on a completely different level. A wealthy European aristocrat is writing a letter. The letter contains a math problem intended for one of the world's foremost mathematicians. This man is mathematician Johann Bernoulli. Of course, he knows the solution. But he adds this. Through this question, we shall find out who are the children and who are the adults. Those who solve it will go down in history. The answer must be provided within six months. The recipients of Bernoulli's letter were the world's most noted mathematicians. In fact, that's how they were addressed on the envelope. The problem was delivered to the most prominent mathematical minds of Europe. Germany, Switzerland, France. The letter was sent to preeminent mathematicians across Europe. Transportation was not as well developed as today, of course. Delivery of the letter took several months. The problem was delivered by master mathematician Johann Bernoulli. Anyone who could answer Bernoulli's challenge would be the best of the best. The question was simple. There were two points, A and B. What curve would make a body move between A and B using gravity in the fastest time? If the answer were a straight line, he wouldn't have even bothered to ask. A famed philosopher was among the recipients. He was a lawyer, a theologian, a diplomat, and an expert with numbers. Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz of Germany was the first to answer. But Bernoulli extended the deadline after he failed to receive a reply from someone he was sure would answer it. In fact, Bernoulli had a particular person in mind with this problem.
that person who most certainly must receive the letter lived across the sea in England. After a year had passed, the letter finally reached his hands. From the moment he first opened Bernoulli's letter, he knew the test was for him. As head of the British Mint, he was a very busy man. But after coming home from work one day, he solved the problem in just a few hours. By that time, only four of these prominent thinkers had arrived at the right answer. For most, it took a few days or a few weeks to solve it. But this British mathematician solved it in far less time. He sent the solution back to Bernoulli, unsigned. His answer was correct. Bernoulli knew the Englishman had sent the answer and said this after reading it. I recognize the lion by his paw. That lion was England's greatest scientist, Sir Isaac Newton. The first respondent had been Gottfried Leibniz, a nemesis of Isaac Newton. These two engaged in the fiercest battle in the history of math. Bernoulli's challenge was at the heart of the conflict between Leibniz and Newton. The question was about what they knew about cycloids. A cycloid might be the pathway created by a bicycle. Set a point on the wheel of a bicycle. As the wheel rotates, the spot creates a particular curve. Which is called a cycloid. Bernoulli's question was about the fastest way from the top to the bottom when a ball is rolled. This is a cycloid curve, and this is a straight line. I'm about to roll these two balls simultaneously. Did you see that the cycloid curve is faster than the straight line? If one knows the fastest pathway, that means he knows the minimum values. In other words, he knows calculus. Bernoulli was testing whether these mathematicians knew how to do calculus. The focus of scholars in those days was on the moving world. And they made some remarkable discoveries from the discovery that there was something faster than a straight line. The first person who recorded this innovation was the greatest philosopher of the day.
it's no easy task finding directions in a strange city. This philosopher was from a small village some 300 miles south of Paris. I'm now looking for a train station. Straight on, and then it would be on your right. No matter how many people I ask, this isn't easy. Go straight. Turn left. Go up. Ah, I need to look upward. I finally found the train station. Actually, if we know just two numbers, longitude and latitude, we can find any location on Earth. If I change my location, those numbers also change. That discovery is not that old. The philosopher whom I'm visiting came up with that system. This town changed its name in 1802 to honor this giant. The 17th century produced the likes of Galileo, Kepler, Shakespeare, and Montaigne. The philosopher René Descartes was also one of the great minds of the era. I think, therefore I am, this is the most famous statement uttered by Descartes. He is better known as a great philosopher. So why does he appear in a story of math? You know the reasons when you look around this house. Je vous en prie, entrez. Voilà, donc vous voyez qu'il s'agit d'une petite maison, mais c'est une maison de bourg. Euh, c'est une maison qui est inscrite à l'inventaire des monuments historiques. Donc c'est une maison du XVIe siècle, hein. euh, avec les poutres, euh, la maison... La René Descartes was born in this house, which holds all sorts of memorabilia from his birth to his death. C'est l'étage noble où l'on vivait. He lived in cities all over Europe and passed away in Sweden. This is a replica of his skull, brought back from Sweden. Descartes was a legendary late riser, and even his wax likeness is dozing off. He spent his mornings in bed, ruminating about the world. He may have appeared lazy, but he was furiously occupied with finding truth. Descartes entre au Collège de Jésuites de La Flèche, et donc il va étudier tous les grands auteurs. Hein? Voici donc euh, les, euh, les grands auteurs qu'on qu étudie à l'époque. Sénèque, Thomas d'Aquin, Virgile tous ces grands euh, philosophes, mais en fait, Descartes va se lasser, il va lire tous les livres, mais il va se lasser en fait de ça. Il aime surtout les mathématiques. Et il dit qu'il aime les mathématiques pour l'évidence de leur raison. How can humans say they know all the truths of philosophy, law, religion, and politics? Descartes thoroughly doubted everything. He stuck to math, which allowed him to uncover truth without skepticism. After rejecting everything he'd learned, Descartes sought a new path. 
The 17th century was a time of journey and adventure, so we joined the military. Descartes volunteered as a mercenary for a Dutch prince. There he met people from all over Europe. One day, his army found themselves stationed in a small German town. The only thing that he still had was his lingering doubt. His mind frequently returned to math. How can I explain the location of a point? Left? More left? Up? Farther up? Such explanations were too vague and subjective. Descartes found an exact way to describe its location. These lines represent the horizontal x-axis and the vertical y-axis. They meet at a point called the origin. The shiny point can be expressed with two numbers. This point is 5 3. The stock market can be a roller coaster even with a single day. Those ever changing numbers are hard to make sense of with a quick glance. We can't figure out which way stocks are going with just these numbers. Thanks to the coordinate system made by Descartes, we can track down changes in the numbers. We live in an age in which every movement can be represented in the form of graph coordinates. Graphs can be useful in keeping track of how a quantity changes. We can see where the numbers are going and even predict their future position. Locations are expressed with numbers. This isn't the only advantage provided by coordinates. Descartes found it possible to combine his coordinate system with geometry. For 1800 years, up to the time of Descartes, it was Euclid's book Elements that dominated math. That book defines a circle this way. A circle is a plane figure contained by one line such that all the straight lines falling upon it from one point among those lying within the figure are equal to one another. It's difficult to understand when you first hear it. Descartes applied this long definition to coordinates. That meant providing numbers for it. What would be the result? Each point is now represented by numbers. By analyzing these points, an equation can be made. x squared plus y squared equals r squared. This is how Descartes defined a circle. Quite simple. The one slowly developing math had added a new dimension. Mathematicians now turn their eyes to curves.
math, began to lead them toward a world that was constantly moving. I am now headed to Hanover in Germany. It is 60 kilometers away. It takes about an hour to get there. 60 kilometers per hour. This is my average speed. But that doesn't mean I will travel at 60 kilometers per hour at every moment. My speed is always changing. So, at this very moment, how can we calculate the speed of the car? Two mathematicians of that era found the answer. One was Isaac Newton of England. The other was Gottfried Leibniz of Germany. Shall we meet Leibniz first? This school was once called the University of Hanover, but in 2008 it was officially renamed Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz University of Hanover. After the great mathematician, this is a mark of great respect. This town has more than 30 research centers that bear his name. It is a sign of his fame here. Among them is the one dedicated to his life and achievements. It is the Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz Library. Wir kommen jetzt zum Leibniz Resort. Stell den Leibniz Nachlass in Feld. Frau Fleck wird ihn öffnen. What does a mathematician leave behind after death? Das bedeutendste Stück im Leibniz-Nachlass ist das einzig erhaltene Exemplar der Leibniz-Rechenmaschine. Hier sehen Sie das Original. This device, completed in 1694, was the first machine that could perform the four fundamental operations of arithmetic. At the time, even many people could not conduct multiplication and division. This was a revolutionary invention. It took several decades to put together, and its parts were hard to find. How did they calculate using this machine? Let's multiply 1,234 by 23. First, we rotate the knobs for the number places to positions 1, 2, 3, and 4. Then, we turn the handle on top three times to mark the unit's place of 23. Moving on to the tens place, we turn the handle twice. The result is 28,382. The correct answer. This machine can be called the grandfather of the computer. Die Rechenmaschine ist der interessanteste, auffälligste Teil des Nachlasses. Viel wichtiger und bedeutender ist aber der schriftliche Nachlass von Leibniz der eine ungeheure Fülle von Papieren umfasst. Leibniz hat über 200.000 Blatt Manuskripte hinterlassen. Unter diesen Manuskripten über 15.000 Briefe, die er mit allen wissenschaftlichen Größen seiner Zeit gewechselt hat. Hier sehen Sie... 100.000 Manuscripts categorized in alphabetical order. We find Isaac Newton's name here. Leibniz left so many manuscripts that they are still in the process of being organized. His body of work, totaling more than 150,000 pieces, is mostly notes, letters, or memos.
He was an expert at math, philosophy, and science, but he didn't write any systemic dissertation in any field. Ein Schreiber, den Brief in Schönschrift geschrieben und dieser Brief ist nach London gegangen. Two of the letters are from Isaac Newton, the most respected scholar of the day. This letter that Leibniz received before writing his thesis became the crux of contention in their future battle. Gottfried Leibniz was as well versed and pragmatic a scholar as Leonardo da Vinci. It was no accident that he came up with an earth-shatteringly brilliant idea by the age of 29. The idea was about moving objects, about their differential. It was a way to calculate the speed of a moving object. Using Cartesian coordinates, set the horizontal x-axis as the distance and the vertical y-axis as time. My car travels to Hanover with an average speed of 60 kilometers per hour. But while driving, the speed constantly changes. So at what speed is the car traveling when it passes the midpoint? Speed is obtained by dividing distance by time. The average speed is 60 kilometers per hour, since it travels 60 kilometers in one hour. In order to find a more accurate speed, we need to narrow the time gap. The speed within this block is 65 kilometers per hour. In this narrower block, the speed is 68 kilometers per hour. An even narrower block, it's 68.5 kilometers per hour. The narrower the gap, the more precisely we can determine speed. Of course, we are unable to keep finding smaller and smaller gaps forever. Instead, we accept a certain average speed which is close to the moment whose speed we're measuring. This is called differential. In 1675, Leibniz published his remarkable results in a scientific journal called Acta Eruditorum. It was like discovering magic. Every object in the world is moving. But until Leibniz, math had not dealt with moving objects. He enabled us to calculate moving things. The volume of a flowing liquid, the changing rate of prices, even a difference in air pressure. Math was reborn with the advent of calculus. Did other scholars know that math would play such a crucial role in the future? Leibniz realized this. His instincts told him that calculus would herald a new era. Leibniz was excited with anticipation that his research would change the course of human civilization. But he discovered there was another mathematician who'd apparently come up with the same thing a few years earlier. Leibniz was condemned as a plagiarist.
ten years before Leibniz published his thesis, this British mathematician knew about calculus. The idea was conceived in his hometown of Grantham, England. This home is his birthplace. He grew up here. This is where he discovered the law of universal gravitation. The interior of the house is arranged as it was when he was alive. Isaac Newton was born in 1642. This happened also to be the year that Galileo died. He was gifted as a scholar, but his childhood was not particularly happy. His mother had only been married in April, so he was born prematurely, a sickly mm -hmm. child, and he was lucky to survive. Um, he was already unlucky because his father had already died mm -hmm. before he was born, so this was very unfortunate for him. Um, later, his mother... Newton was left in this house with his grandmother. And moved away. Mm -hmm. He wasn't close to his mother, his father, or his step-siblings. Instead, he turned inward, and this child loved to think and imagine. That's the way things were in those days. In his childhood, he daydreamed and played with imaginary things. This room was the source of Newton's inspiration. He was curious about everything in the world. One thing that especially attracted his attention was light. He conducted experiments to see how light reaches the eyes. He observed the path of light by poking his eyeballs with different objects. He wasn't the kind of child who worried that such risky behavior might blind him. At his birthplace, there is an apple tree as famous as Newton himself. In celebration of Queen Elizabeth II's Golden Jubilee, the UK's Tree Council designated Newton's apple tree as one of the 50 great British trees. we wonder about the great discovery said to have taken place under this apple tree. Whatever happened, Newton spent many hours enjoying meditation under this tree. He learned a great deal from books, and this future scientist was interested in every phenomenon around him. A falling apple was a constantly moving object. An apple falls down in a straight line. But a planet circles the sun in an elliptical path. Johannes Kepler had figured that out. Planets on an elliptical path don't revolve at a constant speed. Sometimes they move fast, other times slow. To calculate the momentary speed when an object is moving along an elliptical path, Newton used differentials. Newton referred to this as fluxion. In 1665, he defined the term as the changing rate of speed. This was 10 years ahead of Leibniz's discovery.
In the 17th century, the Royal Society of London was the center of the European academic world. In 1703, Isaac Newton had been the head of the Royal Society for a quarter century. At that time, Leibniz was a common member. Twenty years after coming up with the concept of differentials, it was recommended that Newton publish a book. Its official title was The Mathematical Principles of Natural Philosophy. This is one of our most famous manuscripts. This is the Principia Mathematica of Isaac Newton. Uh, it was published by the Royal Society. And here we have the version that went to produce the first edition. This is the manuscript written by Newton himself. You can see the title at the top of the book here, Principia Mathematica Good Philosophiae Naturalis. This is the mathematical principles of natural philosophy. And what Newton was trying to do was give a mathematical expression to how the universe worked. The law of universal gravitation, the law of inertia, and the elliptical orbit of planets were all introduced to the world through this book. He hardly used differentials, but his theories would have been difficult to come by without it. He'd conceived of differentials a decade before Leibniz, but he published it later. The book took two decades to write and for the next two centuries was a steady seller. Had he lived in the 21st century, he almost certainly would have published immediately after his discovery. Newton was very reserved. He lived like a hermit. But when it came to credit for the invention of calculus, he was different. British scientists believe that Leibniz had copied Newton's work. But Leibniz's followers disagreed. They thought Newton had stolen his. The controversy between Newton and Leibniz became a battle between England and continental Europe. Johann Bernoulli sided with Leibniz. In the midst of this battle for intellectual rights, Bernoulli tossed in the question of the cycloid. He was testing whether Newton really knew calculus. Leibniz begged for a fair judgment from the Royal Society. Both Newton and Leibniz were members. Leibniz, a common one, and Newton, the head at that time. The Royal Society opened an investigation and reached a conclusion. Newton would be given the credit as the founder of calculus. Leibniz was said to be the second founder of calculus. But in science, a silver medal has little meaning. Leibniz was buried in a small church in Hanover, Germany. He never fully recovered from the shock of the Royal Society's decision.
When he passed away in 1716, only his secretary attended his funeral. His later life was filled with misery. After realizing its importance, Leibniz devoted his life to calculus, but it didn't belong to him when he was alive. This is Westminster Abbey, called the Soul of England. Newton was interred here. This is a portion of the abbey where some of Britain's greatest figures are buried. William Shakespeare, Lord Byron, Handel, and Winston Churchill. Sir Isaac Newton's place is the largest and most prominent among them. He was considered the greatest scholar of his day, and his place of burial is among the grandest. The battle between the two scholars seemed destructive, but at stake was the legitimate right to a scientific claim. Both in life and in death, it seems Newton had won. But the life of calculus that was their passion took a different view. What was left in the end was Leibniz's version of calculus. The calculus that is taught in math classes today is that of Leibniz. Symbols in terms such as dx and integral were created by him. The thinking today is that both Newton and Leibniz discovered calculus at the same time. Their calculus has escaped the classroom and has been leading us through an ever-moving world. It was quite amazing for such an idea to pop up in different places in the same time period. What's more amazing was that this idea was big enough to change the world even before it was conceived. This can only be explained by recognizing that such an idea ripened and then burst onto the scene in several places at once. The seed of knowledge met two geniuses and it changed the world. We live in a world shaped by math, where rockets are launched into space and planets are explored. Even this was a part of what these great thinkers gave us. <laughs>